Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our 2021 Cleantech Marketing Trends webinar. Well, I think we all have a sense that 2021 is going to be a very exciting year for Cleantech and why exactly we'll hear from our panelists on this webinar. Um, so I mentioned we thought we might get 20 uh, or 50 people sign up for this webinar, but actually 150 people registered on Eventbrite. So there's definitely demand for talking about marketing for clean tech. Uh, before I go on introducing our amazing panelists today, just a little bit of Zoom etiquette. Um, I think you'll be muted automatically as you enter. Feel free to have your video on or off. Um, please do use the chat freely. Uh, this is about creating a marketing, a clean tech marketing community. Uh, we'll be sharing the slides with everyone who registered afterwards and there'll be time for Q&A at the end. So if questions arise, please pop them in the chat throughout and we'll monitor that and then make sure we file them to the panelists. We're super excited to have assembled an absolute team of clean tech marketing superstars today, starting with Carrie Maltzby Loot. As a marketing professor and consultant, Carrie is passionate about, passionate about nurturing the next generation of marketing leaders and entrepreneurs. With over 13 years of experience in marketing, education, and sales, Carrie brings industry relevant knowledge to the classroom and specializes in experiential projects that connect students with real organizations that are committed to sustainability. As a marketing consultant, she helps purpose driven organizations better serve their target audience and grow their business. Carrie has a BA in anthropology from UC Berkeley and an MBA from Mills College. And Carrie is based in the Bay Area. Julia Travellini is Vice President of Marketing and Communications at Incubator Greentown Labs, where she drives the development and execution of the incubator's overall marketing, communications, and public relations strategy. Julia oversees the incubator's event strategy, content creation, social media, and liaises between Greentown and its partners for all marketing-related activities. In her role, she also serves as an in-house marketing consultant for the Greentown's over 100 member companies. And Julia is dialing in from Boston. Dave, who was just cleaning his camera, uh, is the, Dave Kerner is the VP of Global Marketing for 75F, an internet of things based building automation company that is on the Cleantech 100 list of the world's most, the world's most impactful companies and recently closed the largest Series A in Minnesota history with backers including Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Michael Bloomberg and others. Dave is based in Minneapolis. My co-host and today's moderator, Melanie Adamson, is the founder and chief strategist at Alder Agency. Mel is a natural storyteller. If she isn't telling her clients' stories, then she's telling her own. Because Mel began, began her career as a journalist, she effectively uses investigative skills to pinpoint problems and discover communication gaps to be filled. Mel will tell you that she sits at the connection between consumers and brand. For more than a decade, she's built marketing strategies for nearly every IOU, municipal and public utility on the West Coast, and for clean tech companies and energy focused agencies. And Mel is joining us from Portland, Oregon. And I'm Bettina Grab, your host for today. I'm the founder and president of Impact B2B, a marketing agency that helps clean tech companies scale through effective marketing and lead generation. I left my career of over 15 years in global B2B marketing on the corporate side to start Impact B2B and make a difference for the planet. I'm also Cleantech Open's National Marketing Chair and a guest lecturer for Cleantech and Sustainability Marketing at Presidio Graduate School. So this completes our loop around the country because I'm based in the Bay Area, just like Carrie. And you know, we have so many of you joining from all over the US. And this is really about building a clean tech marketing community. So please share your LinkedIn details and also where you're dialing in from uh, on the chat. For those of you who just joined, uh, please mute yourself and you'll be getting the slides at the end. And there'll also be opportunity to ask questions um, after we do our little Q&A. And now I'll hand over to Mel who will lead through the presentation and Q&A. Hello and welcome. I'm really glad to have you here today. So Julia is going to start us off um, with her slides and her overview of what she's seeing uh, trend-wise in marketing and clean tech. Hi everyone, 
Good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you're based. It is fun to see people's locations pop into the chat, so please chime in. Uh, I am very proud to be here today. Thanks so much to Mel and Bettina. Um, it's flattering to be here and honored to speak alongside Carrie and Dave. So uh, great to see you all and be here with you. So Greentown Labs, uh, proud to represent Greentown today. We are the largest climate tech startup incubator in North America. Our headquarters is in Somerville, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston, and we are actively expanding to Houston. I think Chris was one of the first to comment in the chat. He is one of our uh, newer, our first kind of founding member companies at our location in Houston. So that's exciting. Thanks for being here, Chris. In my role, Bettina did a great summary, so I'm not going to waste time on that. Um, but I do want to frame this in that my purview is all about startups. So what I talk about today will most likely be very relevant to startups and very early stage companies. So um, a show of hands or maybe a reaction um, in the Zoom, if you could just raise a hand or do a little, I don't know, Zoom jig, if you're here on behalf of a startup. Um, it's just helpful to kind of know our audience, right? It's about marketing and we're speaking to our audience. So who are we speaking to today? Uh, so let us know kind of what kind of group you represent and what stage company you're at. Um, these trends uh, are specific to the clean tech sector, of course. I think it's interesting to be talking about marketing, clean tech marketing trends, because a lot of these are driven by overall market trends. So when we're talking about the clean tech market, and then our marketing trends and our marketing activities and actions will change based upon market activities as well. So I think it's interesting to kind of underscore that. Um, that a lot of the, the things that Carrie, Dave, and I are going to talk about today really are also related to the overall market landscape. So the top five on my radar, positioning. Um, climate tech, some have argued climate tech may be the rebrand of clean tech. Um, I think that there's a place in time for both. Certainly, we love climate tech and clean tech. At Greentown, we position ourselves right in the clean tech space. We doubled down on this in 2020 when we rebranded, and we see climate tech um, specifically, specifically as solutions that mitigate impacts of climate change and build resilient communities. So that's how we define the types of solutions and entrepreneurs and organizations we're working with and supporting. Um, I believe storytelling and selling is constantly shifting, but of late, it's really about the human side of climate. Climate change is a human challenge. Um, it's been driven by humans, by corporations, um, and it's going to be humans and corporations that help solve it as well. Uh, so I think really underscoring the, the human side of, of climate, talking about the people solving it, talking about the investors who are doubling down and supporting new innovations in climate, um, it's all about the people who are helping in the, this industry move forward. Fostering, certainly the killings of George Floyd and others in the Black community in 2020 sparked a long overdue countrywide racial injustice reckoning. This movement highlighted the lack of diversity in our own industry, and it's driven us all to take steps forward to reflect, learn, grow, and build a more inclusive, diverse, and equitable industry. Um, I think we'll talk a lot more about this today, but I think it, I would be remiss if I didn't note a couple really awesome initiatives that we've seen our partners at Clean Energy Ventures and Masada Partners launch Browning the Green Space here in Boston to specifically create pathways to employment um, for underrepresented communities um, and black and brown specifically in the clean energy space. Also friends at Elemental Accelerator have launched Green Tech Noir, which is a community for black people globally who are working in the business of sustainability and climate. So um, excited to continue the conversation on this specifically uh, from Carrie and Dave, their insights as well. Uh, investing, certainly more capital being deployed in this sector. Um, there's a ton more capital, I think, according to PwC State of Climate Tech in 2020 said that um, clean, climate tech investments grew nearly five times faster than the wider VC industry in tw between 2013 and 2019. So that stat alone shows how much the, the investments are, are really here to enable the deployment and commercialization of these solutions. And then finally, in terms of specific sectors, these, um, these five are really on our radar. Carbon tech, also known as carbon to value in a lot of spheres. Hydrogen, certainly green hydrogen specifically. Offshore wind, buildings, and transportation. I will pause there. I'm probably at my two minute limit, maybe three. Thank you, Julia. That was great. Dave, you want to talk to us about what you're seeing? Sure, absolutely. Um, I'm Dave from 75F. We are a building automation company based here in Minneapolis. We use smart sensors and controls to make commercial buildings more efficient and more comfortable. And our average customer saved 41.8% on HVAC and lighting costs last year, which 
per 50,000 square feet of installed space is roughly the CO2 equivalent of 161 trees, which is a clean tech, clean tech stat that we like, uh, that resonates particularly well with our customers. So we're, short, we're having a big impact and we began as an incubator, um, just like Julie was talking about, an incubator very similar to hers and we've grown up a little more. So I'm excited to be here today as well and to talk about companies that are a bit further along in their life cycle. We're closing a series A. And as a company in that space, a company that's actively fundraising, there's some driving forces that we see within that space. Um, one is that there's a lot of money on the sidelines today. I think if you're in clean tech now, you're probably seeing interest from partners, Fortune 500 companies, um, and investors. And if any other companies are in that fundraising process, I think there's a, a perfect storm of events that are helping. One is that um, those VCs and institutional investors have been sidelined thus far. Another, of course, is a combination of COVID, uh, government legislation and the Build Back Better Biden um, administration proposals, as well as EU, the EU, their Energy Performance and Buildings Directive, um, China has some green initiatives that are happening. So there's sort of a, a perfect storm, a trifecta, as I say here, of those technological advancements, legislation, and um, the impact of COVID. And I think showing the limitations of our traditional infrastructure and organizations. And then uh, we have more mature businesses and models, of course. I think if you look at specific clean tech spaces, this is made clear, certainly energy storage, um, green hydrogen, there's big advancements that are being made there. Carbon capture, which was a pipe dream just you know, a few years ago, and now is showing real promise. Um, micromobility is probably another one where early micromobility companies didn't have very successful business models. And today, due to a combination of factors and government support, they, um, they do. So you add in the the changing perceptions of consumers and employees that are driving these Fortune 500 companies towards cleaner solutions. And the fact that these companies themselves are working to change their brand and to realign um, with cleaner outcomes. And I think what you have is uh, a lot of very positive forces in this sort of second clean tech boom that we've all been experiencing. Thank you, Dave. That insightful. Um, great. Ready to share your trends? Excellent. Good morning. My name is Carrie maltzby Lute. It's uh, truly an honor to be here with everyone today. So um, I'm going to be looking at things from somewhat of an industry agnostic uh, lens um, that I feel is applicable to uh, the B2B space, B2C, and you know, throughout uh, a range of industries. So I'm gonna start by defining trend as a change or development towards something new or different. And so what we're seeing now is really a high level cultural shift. Um, what we've experienced with the pandemic and with the racial reckoning has really led to uh, purpose is the new worldview. Uh, your why and your actions uh, really matter as a, as a brand and as a company. And justice is the new mantra. The S in ESG has gained lots of currency. And with, with this new reality, um, to thrive now in the future, I feel like we have to be, uh, number one, radically human. People now more than ever expect brands to treat them like humans. Uh, we want brands that are acting more like humans. Um, so this means that we want brands that embody human qualities, being transparent, um, having steadfast beliefs, being consistent in actions, and um, authentic with our intentions. Kind of the same way you expect, what you expect from friends, essentially. Um, number two, radically transparent. Uh, there's a sustainable shoe company called Veja, uh, spelled V-E-J-A, for those folks that may have never heard of it. And this is one of the only businesses that my students, very critical thinking students, don't eviscerate. Uh, why don't they uh, tear apart Beja? It's because they're made with ecological materials sourced from organic cotton co-ops that use agroecology farming. 
Um, they, are, they use recycled bot uh, water bottles and 80% of their factory workers are unionized. They also only utilize banks that have no tax havens and green electricity and they tell their story. So it's these kind of you know, brands that can be radically transparent that um, people are going to connect with um, within this new worldview. Number three, radically inclusive. Uh, more than half of our nation's population under uh, age 16 identify as some sort of racial or ethnic minority. So uh, ensuring their success is, is instrumental to our nation. And it also means that we need to embrace diversity and different worldviews uh, if we want to continue to serve the people that we um, care about um, as our customers. Uh, number four, radically in employee centered. Uh, high trust organizations where leaders are credible, employees are treated with respect and believe the workplace is fundamentally fair, have three times the return in the stock market. And for startups, um, it still, it, it matters um, as well, even if you're not at, yet at the IPO level. Uh, and then lastly, number five, radically, radically reimagining your, your model. Um, as far back as 1960, a Harvard business professor, Theodore Levitt, cautioned businesses on the designs of, on the dangers of narrow thinking. Um, some of you may have heard of the concept surrounding marketing myopia, and that essentially talks about when railroad industries were overtaken by automobiles and planes because they didn't understand that they were actually in the transportation business. So I think more importantly, we're going to have to start asking ourselves, what business are you really in and how can you move outside of that conventional construct to kind of redefine who you are and expand um, who you are potentially. So those are my trends and I look forward to talking about them more in detail. Wow, that was, that was super powerful. Thank you, Carrie. That was really great. So we're talking about clean tech trends and, um, you know, and then now we're moving into uh, trends. How in marketing, how are we addressing and marketing these trends that we're seeing? And, you know, one of the things that um, I think we're seeing is a, a jump in startup activity. We talked about there's more investment, there's more startup activity in the clean space. Julia, and, and this is for everyone, but I want to start with Julia. What's the best advice that you can give a startup with a lean marketing budget? Sure thing. By lean, you, you might mean none, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, for our startups out there, um, probably none, and probably you're a founder an early stage founder, at least the earliest stage companies that we see at Greentown are very early, often they're first time founders, um, sometimes first time managers as well. And they're growing up their, their team around them. They've developed this amazing technology solution. They're working on fundraising. Um, they wear a lot of hats. And so first and foremost, I recommend that they don't forget about marketing. <laughs> marketing can often be one of the first things that goes to the bottom of the to-do list. And, and Later on, when we hear about some of the challenges they're facing, facing in customer discovery, sales, customer acquisition, pilot project deployment, it comes back to, okay, well, how are you messaging your solution and your product and, and your service? Um, so focusing on your messaging. So build up that baseline of, of your marketing assets. So what's your value prop? How do you communicate it really effectively, succinctly to the lay person? How are you presenting this information, both in a digital way, any printed material assets? So sort of these like core foundational pieces. What's your digital presence? Do you have your website? Does it look like it was not made in the 90s? Let's make sure that that's like, it's at least current day look and feel. Have somewhere where you can capture leads, whether it's just a newsletter sign up on your website, just so you slowly from the beginning are capturing people who are remotely interested in your, in your technology or solution. Maybe it's truly just your friends and family at first, but that list will grow. So having that organized in one centralized place is really important. Capture those social media handles so that no one else, like maybe you don't wanna do Twitter right now because it's not a good use of your time, you're one person, but later you may want to. You may down the road have a, a team of marketers who can do that for you. So build up that baseline and then plan it. You know, you do a weekly planning session, you have a scrum meeting with your team on Mondays. What are you doing for marketing? Um, so build up that foundation, happy to send along like a list to those afterwards who are interested in sort of those top 10 items, your pitch deck, um, your, your about us description, your social handles you should capture, happy to continue the conversation offline afterwards. That's super important. I totally agree with you, Julia, building that foundation is great. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about um, is the 
tech specifically. And Dave, you, one of the things that you had mentioned is tech, new tech driving a lot of the clean tech trends. And, you know, I, I know me personally, I've spent a lot of time educating people on energy and are, you know, helping them understand um, new technology. Do we, is it, you know, it's complicated to understand. How do we um, acknowledge the fact that, you know, it's very complicated technology in a very complicated industry? Um, do we continue the education or, um, you know, is it really important if they know how it works at all? Do you have thoughts on that? Certainly. There's a book, my new favorite book is Crossing the Chasm. It's the, I think, 1990s release that has been released a few more times. And essentially, they talk about innovators and early adopters and the gap between early adopters and the pragmatic majority. So as a startup, you're, you're hyper-focused on your first dozen customers and those innovators and early adopters. But as you begin to scale, it becomes increasingly important not just that you educate customers, but the way in which you educate them. Um, you know, seeing them at eye level, avoiding acronyms, explaining new technologies using old paradigms that are easily understandable to those more traditional risk averse, very conservative customers. And I think the book does a great job of it. So I'm not gonna, um, you know, try to paraphrase the book too much, but there's uh, some takeaways specific to that education piece that I think are really important. Um, and as a startup, the challenge is constantly, just piggybacking on what Julia said, the challenge is constantly that you're trying to be asymmetric, that you don't have enough resources to produce a white paper every month there to go into enough, enough depth to really, um, to really educate an entire industry. I'll just use 75F as an example. If we tried to convince customers about the benefit of smart buildings, that's uh, that's a losing that's a losing strategy because our competitors are the Honeywells and the Johnson Controls and the Siemens of the world that will always out resource us, always have more marketers. If it ever comes down to a question of who has the larger marketing team, we're always going to lose. So. I think a core part of strategy is choosing the places where you're not going to compete and the ways in which you're going to educate customers. So within 75F, we have this principle where we're not attempting to create demand for, in our case, building automation solutions. We're instead attempting to, to satisfy or meet demand for IoT-based BMS systems like ours. So we're not trying to convince customers of the benefit. We're trying to convince them of the benefit of 75F. One way that we do that is to, to ask customers if their building is browser ready. That's a very simple, easily understandable way without going into the details of what is a smart building and what is a smart city and what isn't and what are the energy benefits of bringing building systems online. We could simply ask if buildings are online and tell them how easy it is to get there. So. We're educating them in a very narrow and very focused way. And I think because we have fewer resources, because all, all of us in clean tech have fewer resources, that's gonna be a winning model. That's really cool. And I like that both you and Julia really talked about, um, you know, knowing your customer, authenticity, um, brand, um, those are, you know, big highlights. Um, can, I, can I jump? Can I jump in and say one more thing? Just piggybacking yeah. on that thought is yeah. there's this there's this debate about strategy versus execution. You know, which do I need first? I'm a founder. I maybe I don't even have a marketing team yet, or I just stepped into the role. I'm a marketing director, but I'm doing everything myself. Like there's a lot of balls in the air. I think it's really important that you nail strategy early. And the biggest mistake that startups I see startups within the clean tech space make is that they are unclear about strategy and it makes their tactics um, just much more diluted. They're trying to do a lot of things not very well, like the, the classic mile wide and inch deep. Mm -hmm. And if you have to outsource that strategy or if you have to do an offsite or just ask for a week or a month to really get complete alignment from product or services teams through your executive and leadership team, um, make sure that you have enough resources to execute 
that strategy uh, or bringing an outside agency to help you develop that strategy, then the tactics are what generally I think I've seen tech startups do fairly well. Once they, once they know the systems and tools, I think you can, you can replicate, you can produce content, but the strategy ends up being a very critical component. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's great too. I, I wholeheartedly believe in that. Um, I wanted to jump to something that Carrie had talked about and um, something that really resonated with me was radically evolving culture among consumers. And um, I think, you know, we can all learn something from this. Um, you know, how do we address that culture change that is happening among businesses? I think it's easier for us to kind of um, relate to that on a personal level, but once you start to take that in house inside your business, you know, how do we how do we start to evolve that with employees and consumers? Um, you know, what do you what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, great question. Um, so just to set further context, you know, I live in the Bay Area, uh, which is a bastion of progression, right? And I teach at these schools that are um, really dynamic in that they have. You know, they're providing MBAs and business education for people who believe that business can be used for good, right? Um, but at the same time, recognizing that there's uh, business alone can't solve the problems, right? And so there's policy things that come into play. So, um, you know, I do see, uh, you know, I, I call some of my students the anti-capitalist capitalist, you know, so that's what kind of my, I'm dealing with. Um, and I love it. Uh, you know, they're, they're brilliant systems thinkers. Um, and as far as consumers and employees and kind of this larger world, I think we're also seeing uh, people that are smarter and savvier about marketing messages and about business overall, right? And so um, I, I also see this growing distrust um, of our economic models and our systems and capitalism within the, the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, people questioning the neoliberal approach about marketization of everything. Um, so I do see uh, some, some cultural pushback um, from some folks that, that feel like um, the commodification of self. Um, we see that a lot through with social media and growing influencers. And also, you know, likely as a result of our gig economies, right? More and more people depending on various streams of income. So I think that's probably the darker side of, you know, some of the, the things that I'm seeing. Um, and what I, how that relates to business is that I think it's more important than ever for businesses to be very clear on their purpose, um, you know, why they are doing business and, um, you know, why we should care and who they're serving, you know, very clear on that societal aspect, which is of increasing concern to um, this very diverse population, which we talked about earlier, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that we're seeing, you know, brands that have to be radically inclusive. Um, you know, and I know I'm using probably more B2C examples because they're somewhat accessible. Um, but when we think about, you know, Victoria's, the Victoria's Secret era, um, I feel like that's gone. Um, you know, a, a brand that's sustainable on the B2C space is Girlfriend Collective. Um, they use post-consumer water bottles to make um, leggings and they're very body positive and uh, including a range of ages and ethnicities and these are the brands that uh, people are now connecting more with, um, ones that are more human like us. And it goes back to that issue of transparency, which I talked about earlier by highlighting the Beja shoe, Shoes um, supply chain. It's gonna be really important. Who are you doing business with? Even within the business to business space, clean tech, um, there's gonna be apps now like the app Progressive Shopper um, that rates business on their levels of progressiveness. And so I think we're going to start seeing this um, throughout um, all of the marketplace, our opportunities for consumers to start choosing how to spend their money based on their value system. These are all really insightful strategies. And I know that we can probably talk about this all day long. <laughs> One of the things I did want to get to, too, uh, during this webinar is, um, you know, start to move toward tactics. And I know that you guys put together a couple of slides, um, some takeaways that people can start using today, essentially, um, if, if they have strategies in place. Um, Julia, I think you're first on your takeaway slides. 
Gosh, I can't believe we're already at this part of the session. I feel like we just, anybody want to just keep chatting for longer? <laughs> um, sure thing. So some of the, the top line ones. So make sure your value prop is, is tight and nailed and you can communicate it in layman's terms. A lot of the folks we see at Greentown are developing amazing, very technical innovations to combat climate change, but not everyone listening is going to have a PhD in XYZ. So make sure you can speak to the layperson um, to, to all of your potential customers. Speaking of customer discovery, uh, for our startups, for any startups on the line, we cannot underscore this um, enough or bold in it in font. It, it's so critical to know who your customer is. Um, that is a pathway to success. So make sure you're doing your customer discovery activities. It's ongoing, um, but focus on your beachhead market. You, you can't be everything to everyone, so know who your customer is. Um, build that marketing foundation. We talked a bit about that earlier. Happy to follow up offline with folks about that specific list. And then um, engaging the media. I won't go into this too, too much, but I do think that um, when done at the right time and built into your strategy, as Dave was mentioning, media engagement and press coverage can be so helpful and build a lot of momentum around startups. So doing that in the right way, perhaps bringing on a partner to help with that um, is really important. Uh, also just feel like I need to do a shout out to Green Tech Media because my heart broke a little when yeah. I saw that Wood Mac is shutting them down. So just, mm -hmm. yeah, let's just do a virtual round of applause for those journalists. Yeah. Um, and then fostering, yeah, thanks Dave. <laughs> Uh, fostering, so, so back to this, we've, we've talked a bit about this, but just making sure your company, um, no matter the stage, size, scale, scope, um, what your service is, what your company is, your technology is, focusing on your company's DEI efforts and to Carrie's very astute point, like your supply chain, who are all your customers, your partners, who are you doing business with? Uh, because that's, uh, it's really important to your overall authenticity and um, vision of your brand and how people interpret it. Those are great. Dave? Yeah, uh, we mentioned this, but I think the pandemic has actually changed something. I think this was probably a change that was already gonna take place and this pandemic has just accelerated that change. I think it's probably a generational one. It's too early to say, of course, but it seems generational, it feels that way. I think air and water quality, um, is something that's close to us here, ventilating buildings, redirecting air where it's needed most in small and large offices. But I think it's affecting mobility and health as well. Um, you know, there's a list there. It's hard to imagine a space that's not at least tangential, tangentially, is that the word? I'm not even sure what the word is, but uh, it's, hard not, it's hard to imagine a space that's not affected, right? And um, Julia mentioned business model, certainly product market fits important. Looking a little deeper in the customer life cycle, again, my focus is just on scaling clean tech companies and scale comes from um, resources. It comes from partnerships and that, uh, that acquisition and partnership, I think is, is hotter than it's ever been within this space. Um, there's going to be a lot of companies that are swallowed up of fragments and market is going to become a more consolidated one and having a sustainable business model and some rock solid finances, uh, solid revenue model, customer life cycle, whatever it is, is becomes increasingly important. And then finally, just going back to that book, because again, I encourage everybody to read it. It's a fast read. Um, and it really resonated with me. It's a book about SaaS, but it, it really resonated on our side, just where we're at as a company. We're, we're trying to cross the chasm right now. And there's places where we're failing that, uh, you know, you find on page 43 and you're like, oh, that's why, <laughs> that's why that happened. Um, sharing impact, um, going back, I mean, I think Julia said it, that's always important, but inconvenient truths is something that is, uh, you know, I think, well, this is a, this is a tangent, but I think Al Gore and Inconvenient Truth, I think that did a lot of harm to um, the clean tech movement, because I think there's a consumer perf uh, perception that these products are more expensive. They're not going to work as, as good. They're, 
not going to be right for me. That's going to be too difficult to implement. And with these more mature models, I think we're seeing some very successful companies and there's no inconvenience. There's only benefits. I think clean technology is more accessible than ever before to our customers. And that's the story that we should be trying to tell. That's the specific and positive vision we should be trying to tell. So rather than talking about a global climate crisis, which is appealing to a very progressive customer, we're instead talking about clean air and water in our cities about reducing demand on existing infrastructure like we see right now, unfortunately, in Texas. Um, I think you're trying to reframe conversations in order to make them very real to customers. And as you're working to scale and as you're working to reach um, greater market share and that pragmatic majority, these are all things that are extremely important. Great takeaways, Carrie. All right, I believe I'm off mute. Um, so my five takeaways, uh, storytelling, you'll see a lot of overlap with Julia and I was nodding my head to a lot of the things that she was talking about, especially this idea of just um, speaking to people um, where they're at um, and using accessible language, uh, storytelling um, from this human-centered narrative to reach uh, more people. I think when we talk about clean technology, technology, renewable energy, um, the masses oftentimes don't understand it's what, what we're talking about, it's jargon. And so I think whenever possible, how do we uh, make connections between our brands with concepts that anyone can wrap their head around? So it could be, it could take form from like simple analogies um, to everyday life, right, that sticks. Um, that makes people understand more about the value of energy resilience because it's about being able to um, share dinners with your with your family. It's about being able to have do homework um, and ensuring that that you know we're not experiencing what Texas is going through. You know, so how do you connect this to to real world issues and problems and do it in a way that's empowering? So, um, you know, love love the idea of, of storytelling to. Um, more humanize this whole industry. Uh, and then moving to remaining agile. Uh, as we know, we can't control a lot of what happens in our world, right? Um, in California, we deal with wildfires that seem like they're reoccurring now, but they always kind of take us by surprise. And, you know, we've seen it with the pandemic, with um, the, the movements around social justice. And so how do we um, remain um, agile so we don't appear tone deaf? Um, so if you have a content calendar, it's recognizing that you might have to change things um, and that you should just build in flexibility uh, within your, your content planning so that you can um, allow space to comment and connect with the real world things. Some of them that are great and that are beautiful that are happening that just pop up. Um, and, you know, committing to D, uh, DEI, um, DNI, however you want to put that. Uh, I would say if, if you're kind of lost and not sure what to do, um, hire a, a consultant um, to help support you. Um, but I do think having a strong foundation is really important. We've seen those CEOs that have um, scaled companies quickly, um, or founders, I should say, still scaled companies quickly and didn't have the infrastructure and the HR and the culture in place. And then maybe some of their actions or things they said got them in trouble and ultimately made them lose their, their, um, their company. And so I think, you know, this is, this, this relates to risk aversion, you know, ensuring that you can scale quickly and do so great. Um, so I think that, uh, again, hiring culturally flexible people um, is also um, important. Like, let's say you live in areas where there's just not as much diversity. Um, there's, there's the opportunity to hire people that have lived and, um, and worked with various communities or that, um, again, can kind of navigate different spaces, different socioeconomic backgrounds. And so I think that um, the more you hire people like that, the more diverse perspectives you will get as well. Um, and one interesting thing that uh, um, I've, I've heard of is, you know, removing names from applications, um, for, from resumes, so you can further limit potential bias. Um, and uh, another takeaway, uh, make, making employees your stars. Um, again, and this kind of goes back to that company culture, which is so important to brand, because brands really start with um, the people that you're serving. Um, 
you know, and it's so important that employee experience and ensuring that you're trusting them because it's really going to um, set the stage for uh, how your company is even viewed externally. Um, and then also making them stars um, is, is great marketing. Your employees become your marketers for you. They do so much work um, when, they are, when they trust uh, the company they work for. And then um, lastly, tapping MBA talent. So uh, we've, we've said a few times, I'm, um, I, I do experiential projects in my classes. Um, and we have at Presidio Graduate School, we uh, work with real companies to help them uh, develop plans for operations, finance, and marketing. So I would say, you know, reach out to myself, um, you know, and I know there's other schools that also do similar things, but just think about how you can also kind of leverage um, and get additional um, support um, as, you're, as you're scaling your business. And um, I do want a bonus. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with uh, Clubhouse, uh, but, but it's uh, kind of breaking the internet in a lot of ways. And it's a very great place. A lot of startups and a lot of VCs are on there. So I would say um, get in there and, and um, try to connect and build community um, with new apps like, like Clubhouse. So. Yeah. I'm really grateful for everyone here today. Um, I think we are uh, building a great community uh, just on this just on this call today. Um, so we went through a couple. We went through strategies. We went through some takeaways that you guys can start using, um, start thinking about right now in your own companies. So one of the things we wanted to do to kind of make this a fun, exciting webinar um, is do some fast questions. So I'm just going to throw out questions to our panelists and then. At the same time, just tell me what you think um, the first thing that comes to your mind when I say this. And then I'm going to do another round of overrated or underrated for certain things. And um, we'll see. We'll see what everyone says. Okay, so fast questions. Mm -hmm. Favorite channel for B2B marketing? HubSpot. Boom. LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Bettina, do you want to add one? Yeah, I, I would say LinkedIn as well. Okay. All right. Awesome. All right. What's the hottest trend for PR? Video. Yeah. Yeah. Video and, and social media stories. Yeah. Sure. You're talking about sort of uh, componentizing, granularizing. PR stories into bite-sized pieces. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, when I say digital marketing, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Website. Social no. media. Retargeting. Ooh. Okay. Well, we, we've stalked across the internet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now we're going to start underrated or overrated. Okay. Virtual trade shows. Overrated. Mm. Underrated. I'm indifferent. <laughs> get the email list. <laughs> Most important thing. Right. Get the emails and then you're golden. I'm biased because Greentown did a big one in November 2020. So we're, we, uh, I'm biased, but yeah, you need the email list for sure. Okay. So, so what did you do to make it work? I'm asking for a friend. We go and we, there's just crickets. Well, we did, so we used the platform itself was Hopin. Um, mm -hmm. And it, we, there was a random connection um, ability to do networking of, uh, in the networking showcase. And then the actual trade sh show floor, there was a plat part of the digital platform was you could, we constantly rotated the logos of virtual booths so people in the alphabetical order didn't just see the people at the A's so we kind of constantly reminded attendees of who what booths they could go visit and click um, it also was coupled with a pretty um, solid lineup of speakers so it was a combination speaking event with um, a trade show booth of our startups that's cool okay overrated or underrated SEO underrated oh, oh gosh I was gonna say over I was going to say under. <laughs> Over, overrated if you have a small market. Right. I was going to say it take. That's take true. To, you have to have resources. That's very so true. Yeah, that's it makes it seem easy, but. I would say underrated. Under. Uh, email campaigns. Underrated. Underrated. 
Great. Woo! Yeah. Yes, I think that we're, yeah, same across First the one. Board. Okay, last one. Webinars. <laughs> underrated. <laughs> yeah, underrated. This is great. This is fun when you're with your people, you know? Like, this is, yeah, hard to hear when it's targeted and you're, you know, it's a, a I think it's underrated. Right. right that's great okay so now we're gonna we have about 13 minutes left we want to go into q a uh with people um our audience's questions i have been monitoring them and i'm just gonna jump in uh didn't have time to fire them to you yeah so first one that came in from was from chris westmoreland i hope i'm pronouncing that correctly sorry chris how do you stop yourself or how do you keep from spending so much when you have to keep pivoting as a startup? Maybe Julia or Dave. Well, yeah, what you one way. Yeah, go ahead. One way is just to pivot to your first customer. In other words, it's a soft pivot where you're offering a new product or service to a small handful of customers to see if it works. Um, so that eliminates this kind of constant uh constant changes to messaging into the website all you got to do is change one powerpoint deck pitch a customer win a customer and then you're off to the races i think you see a lot of companies doing that sort of soft launching of vertical or horizontal um, product features new products new services so before you worry about about allocating scarce resources towards this new offering, you can soft launch it. And digital has been the game changer there because you can fire up just a simple landing page rather than build out a full site and you can be live, you know, in an afternoon. And you can deliver a, a key customer or even an existing customer a presentation in order to upsell them on some new product or service or to pivot into a new space. And you can use account-based marketing campaigns so that you're not polluting existing customers or confusing your brand. I think it, it should be easier than ever before. In practice, I'm sure it's a lot harder than I just made it sound, but um, that would be a start. Julia, you look uh, like you have firsthand experience of this. <laughs> no, well said, all very, I agree. In, in the digital world we're in, I think we can, we can pivot really quickly. I think I would also go back to you, Chris, and, and ask what you're spending money on. Like, is I, I would argue at an early stage, most of your money should be toward the platforms that are enabling you to do your marketing campaigns or enabling you to disseminate the information of your message, of your product, of your service. So that spend shouldn't necessarily change. It should be the, um, sorry, I'm seeing Ken's comment. Great comments, Ken. Um, it, it's, it should be things that you can change without spending a ton of money. And then I suppose design, you know, outsourcing design, that is a cost that you can control, but maybe it's talking with a designer who would do, you know, a couple month retainer, or six month retainer with you as your needs evolve. Um, but I, I think that the platforms you spend money on should be consistent. And to Dave's point, you can do A-B testing in a lot of different ways in a, in a free way. Okay. Just, I just spoke. This is kind of a real world question because yesterday I was contacted by a clean tech startup in Washington, D.C. They have a small footprint um, nuclear reactor for clean energy to the grid to help decarbonize our grid. And they transitioned from nuclear advocacy and nuclear services and consulting to selling a physical product. So they've transitioned from a contact-based marketing campaign to an account-based marketing campaign effectively. And they were trying to figure out how to move from where they were to where they need to be to a space where um, in a country like the Czech Republic or something, there's only a dozen people that they need to reach. And that pivot is easier than ever before now because you can, you don't even need an account-based marketing tool to pay for a demand base or something. All you need is the email address of those 12 um, you know, to find them on LinkedIn to run a account-based strategy towards a very narrow target market. And thus, you can move your KPIs from ones centered on sessions or impressions to ones that are just centered on engagement among that narrow addressable market. So it should be 
it should be easier if I, if you execute those pivots or those new product introductions correctly. Okay. Um, uh, that was a question that Carrie answered in the chat, but I think it's so important that I'd like to uh, put it out here again. So for Carrie, how does someone prove that they are inclusive? Yeah, that's a great one. So um, I think proving that you are inclusive uh, data is going to be uh, speaks for itself, right? And we see that larger um, companies are starting to uh, report um, and put out their DNI reports every year. Um, and Oftentimes, they aren't um, necessarily as proud of them as, as they, they um, you know, the, the, there's a lot of issues, there's weaknesses that are, um, we exhibit in this data, but they're putting it out there. And so um, I think that's one way that, uh, you know, companies are, are showing that. And then people are, again, just kind of demanding that, that companies' actions match their words. And so I think when you're smaller, um, when you're a startup, it's okay. You're not necessarily going to be the diverse team, but I think over time, people are going to expect something different as the market evolves and matures and as your company does as well. So I'm not sure if that kind of answered it, but I think that, you know, trying to use data is always a great way. And then also, um, you know, when you don't really, you know, if you don't have that diversity, what are, uh, what are organizations that you can partner with? Julia mentioned some of the work being done um, within clean tech to partner with uh, various nonprofits and organizations to um, better serve underserved populations. And so I think there's opportunity to um, make strategic partnerships that will fuel that pipeline in a way that um, it comes across as authentic um, and that actually helps drive uh, your goals forward. Also love what's going on in the chat here. People are answering each other's questions. So that's amazing. Thanks for creating this little community. Um, there was a question earlier, which um, I guess was more from business sense, but I'm going to phrase it as a marketing question. So Ivan has observed, or they did some research um, to say there's actually a lot of demand for clean tech in South America, but that the US or North America based clean tech scene seems to be focused on North America. Do you have any experience, you know, from a marketing perspective, when should people look at starting marketing themselves internationally? I guess that's also, it's driven by the strategy, but do you have any experience or views on that? It's driven, it's driven by partnerships, I think. I'm just jumping in. But I, I think a strong partner, you would go in whatever market they, that partner wants to take you. Um, you know, you need folks on the ground, translation services. It can be fairly daunting, but if you have the right partner and you have an easy entry into a new market, you already have... Um, you have everything that, that customers need in terms of um, implementation and support and training already rolled into one. At, at 75F, we're always looking for new partners. We've identified strategic countries, and then we're waiting for those partners to um, open offices and launch in those, in those places. I think it comes back to if your customers are there too, from, from like if you're an early stage startup and you're trying to scale up your technology and your solution, where are your customers? Do you have a unique product offering that would be applicable in India? Is it like, I, I, I think for early stage companies, when you're thinking about your beachhead and your go to market strategy, um, it all just comes back to where your customers are. I don't know if that's answering the question. Bettina, I think yes. I did. I think we also think about translating copy or our marketing materials or even our website, but translation extends to all of the training and all the support and the, uh, the terms and conditions. I mean, it's the translation alone becomes a huge lift if you're, if you're going to enter a new country. So I think there's a phased approach that's probably required. So I think our last question is, um, and one that I just saw uh, on the chat is, uh, how important is a CRM? Essential. <laughs> Depends on how many customers you have, but if you have more than, than you can keep in your head, you probably need a CRM. Yeah, I yeah. think I responded in the chat, but I, I think that early, as a startup, it often, like I imagine if you're a startup on the call, you may do this in an Excel spreadsheet. 
Um, and I would encourage you to move over to an act to a CRM platform. It, the earlier you start, the easier it'll be down the road, the easier it'll be when you actually start to move towards more sophisticated marketing campaigns and sales activities. So I would recommend it. There's some great free ones out there too, if you don't have the budget for it. Um, but definitely recommend, you know, HubSpot, Monday.com. There's, yeah, HubSpot is the go-to free one. So yeah, highly recommend. I think as Julia said, it helps with, you know, it start, you can start linking all your social media activities. It pulls all the measuring measurement into one place. You can really then measure how effective your marketing is, you know, which isn't in a traditional sense, that was never the function of a CRM, but now they're becoming these all encompassing platforms that really marry marketing and sales, which is where the magic happens. Um, so yeah, I, I can echo that. We talked, here, we talked earlier about being user-centric and authentic, and I think that's also an important uh, attribute of a CRM is that you're able to deliver better customer service and better user experience because you know all the touch points that that customer's previously had. So it just makes you sound more intelligent, adds value all the way down the chain. It's fairly essential, I think. Last thing on the, the power of uh, CRM tools, you know, segmentation, right? As we talk about communicating um, like a human to other people, we have to do that based on the fact that different groups want different messages. And so a CRM makes that possible. So it's, you know, essential to everything for all the reasons shared. I, I cannot believe how quickly the time flew. Um, and I know, you know, we could go on this forever, uh, for hours, and we have so much experience and skills and value on this call. So first of all, thank you so much to our panelists, uh, Julia, Carrie, and David for joining us and spending your time and sharing your wisdom. Thank you, Mel, for doing an awesome job uh, moderating this panel. Thank you to Jasmine, our intern who helped manage the tech in the background. That was very kind. Um, thank you everyone who joined. Um, sorry if we didn't get to all your questions. We hope you still got something valuable out of this. And uh, let us say it this way, we were overwhelmed by the demand and response to this webinar. So there is clearly a need for this marketing, clean tech marketing community. And it's something that we want to continue to establish. So keep an eye out for, um, you know, for social media posts from both um, Impact B2B and Alder Agency. Um, we will be running these again in the future. And as I said, uh, everyone who registered will get the recording and also the slides. And uh, you'll get some instructions on how you can also schedule a follow-up free consultation with Mel and I to, you know, address any of the questions that didn't get answered today around your clean tech marketing strategies. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everyone. Hope you have a great day, great afternoon. Um, and yeah, thanks again for joining. <laughs>